Kataributai in Hawaii. Aloha! Konnichiwa everyone! My name is Sosuke Kinoshita. In 2010, I was involved in a project called Shinto Mythology, storytelling event that would travel all through Japan. At the same summer, I came to Oahu to write a movie script about the Japanese Americans in Hawaii. I discovered many Shinto shrines here and I went through the islands visiting them. Shinto shrines are locations where the kami, Japanese deities, are worshipped. Many Japanese go to these islands to pray. Story about the kami are found in the book Kojiki, or record of things from the past. It is one of the Japanese oldest story collection gathered in Sebun 12, 1300 years ago. The Kojiki creation tales are awesome. It begins with the thick mud floating over the oceans. This ocean kami solidified this mud, giving birth to the great earth. Then other islands were born, including Japanese island. The kami of the sun, the moon, and the large ocean emerged. Once the kami of the mountain and the river rivers and the plants came into being, humans were brought to life. While on Oahu, my friends taught me how Japanese and Hawaiian belief are similar. Both worship the spirits living in nature. I heard the sky story of the how Sky Father, Wakea, and the Earth's goodness, Papa, creating the world. Wow! so similar to the story of Izanagi and Izanami. This similarity in creation inspired me to look deeper for the roots of Japanese immigration to Hawaii. One day, driving through the part of Honolulu called Makiki, I passed the cemetery with many gravestones. I stopped to take a closer look at the one of the majestic stones. In Japanese, it said, this monument remembers the first group of immigrants who crossed the sea from Japan to Hawaii in the first year of the Meiji era. Hmm. Nearby, there was another stone monument. It was erected in 100 years after the next ship full of Japanese workers came into Hawaii in 1885. Over the next 40 years, many ships followed bringing 220,000 Japanese to Hawaii to work on the plantations and make Hawaii their home. These two monuments got me wondering about these early Japanese pioneers. What part do they play in creating today's Hawaii? A gentle breeze touched my cheeks. I started imagining how Honolulu have been different 150 years ago. Sugarcane plantations were all over Hawaii, but they couldn't keep or recruit any workers. Do you know why? Because plantation work was so hard. To fix this problem, 1860, Hawaii's king Kamehameha V invited workers to come from Japan, China, Portugal, and Philippines. So in 1868, the first year of the Meiji era in Japan, very first group of 148 Japanese workers landed in Honolulu Harbor. It did not work out well. Plantation housing was horrible, pay was terrible, and most of them weren't farmers. They were totally unprepared for the hard work growing the canes. The Japanese government realized this experiment had failed 
and brought these workers to Japan. Fifteen years later, 1874, a new treaty was signed between Japan and Hawaii. King David Kalakaua favored good relations with Japan. It promised the workers better conditions and the pay. Ten years later, 1885, the steamship City of Tokyo docked in Honolulu Harbor. It carried the second group of 945 Japanese immigrant workers. One was Masakichi Yasuda, a 20-year-old man from Yokohama. Masakichi was full of excitement to be starting a new life in a new land. I will work very hard, earn my money, and make a happy family everyone to see, and go back to Japan as a wealthy man. I will show those who are at home who look down on me. Masakichi was born in the in the family of farmers. His life was always hard. At age 15, he was sent to Tokyo store selling the footwear. One day he got into the argument with the customer making unreasonable demand and he was fired. After that, everything he did failed. He moved from one job to another. People frowned at him saying, Ah, oh, this guy has no guts. Whenever a job gets even a little harder, he gives up right away every single time. Has no guts. So when Masakichi heard about this job, he applied. He's one of the lucky 944 chosen by the government out of 28,000 applicants. Masakichi looked around the Honolulu Harbor. He saw something arching across the sky. Wow! Sugoi! Nishida! A big, beautiful rainbow! It's a sign! Hawaii is welcoming us! I will show them what kind of guts I got! His dream was getting bigger and bigger. Soon, at the plantation camp, the workers went to their new home, a small building like a wooden box shared with 10 other workers. I can't believe it. We are stuffed in this shack like sardines, in the bathroom shared with a woman, and not enough space for everyone, and stink all the time. How can they put us in such a place? But Masakichi remembered his promise to himself. I will keep silent. I will work hard. I will make it all good. Soon, he discovered what work in the sugarcane field was all about. Physical, back-breaking labor. My job? Pull, pull out the weeds, rake out rocks, and plant cane, and water them until the cane grows tall. When flower tassel in the sky, then come the fire. Oh, so hot. After that, take the kajite knife, cut one by one by one. And after that, I will tie them, stock them, and lift and carry and drop into the wagon to the mill. I did this 10 hours a day, six days a week. No one can say I cannot work. No one can say I have no guts. No, not after this. He saved money. He made do with just a drive of piece of bread and chunk of taro and some onion, onion skemono pickles. They were cheap. I go back to Japan as a wealthy man. Year has passed. Masakichi saw a strong Japanese girl named Tsuru working in the same field. 
they encourage and care for each other working in the fields. Masakichi fell in love with Tsuru. Eventually, they got married. Soon after, Tsuru gave birth to a baby boy, Shokichi. Everyone rejoiced in this new family's happiness. However, when Shokichi was three months old, he awoke with a severe diarrhea. He quickly fell into the state of dehydration. There were no doctors. He became weaker and weaker, and in few hours, he passed away. Shokichi! 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 Forgive me! You're dead because of me! Our family's life has been blown out because of me. I don't know what to do now. I want to go back to Japan. Husband, if you give up now, what will you, what will we do? You're here for a reason, to achieve your dream, prove yourself, don't give up. For Shoichi, please don't. We need you to be strong. That's right. I came here to prove myself for the dream. I will work hard. I will make all good. That's right. I will. Masakichi hugged Tsuru and dedicated himself to his dream. He would stay in Hawaii. He would keep laboring with the cane, with the knife under the burning sun. This happened three years after Masakichi arrived in Hawaii. A year later, they had a second son and then a baby girl. Although they hoped for a wealthy life, their standard of living did not improve at all. Plantation life for Japanese immigrant, uh, immigrants was terrible. They were paid less than all other workers. And every day, vicious plantation bosses the Luna screamed and threatened them, riding on a horse and cracking his whip. They were slave in all but name. This treatment is unacceptable. How can they hate us just because we are Japanese? The way Luna step on our dignity, I cannot tolerate. He's like Oni. A demon! Humiliated, enraged, Masakichi bit his lip so fiercely the blood oozed from his mouth. Hawaii's Japanese newspaper began to demand better working conditions and higher wages. They called for organizing unions. The Hawaii's English newspaper argued a compromise through discussion. Soon, a Japanese association was organized. The worker chose a president as a Hapa man, half Japanese, half Caucasian, named Fred Kinzaburo Makino. He was taller than everyone else, and the worker expected him to argue with the one pl white plantation owners as an equal. The movement spread. Masakichi Plantation Association spread to fight together with Makino for workers' rights pull down this wall of prejudice, and then beautiful rainbow of justice will appear. In 
May 1909, Masakichi hung the Japanese flag over the door of their housing unit and went on a strike with others. The movement spread to the older plantation on Oa. It became a general strike by 7,000 Japanese workers. The owners resisted. Masakichi and other strike leaders were arrested and thrown into a prison. When he came out, he was fired and forbidden to enter the cane plantation ever again and forever. Masakichi was crushed. I am so worthless. How can I face Tsuru and the children? Instead, for the first time, he permitted himself to get drunk. Masakichi shed bitter tears, his large back shaking with emotion. Even here, I am beaten. I try to live for my family. I tried hard. And again, I'm crushed by big bosses every time. What do I do now? At sunrise, drunk, wandering home, a carriage passed. He stumbled, ah! knocked to the ground. He lay limp, broken, motionless. The blood poured out of his ears and eyes. Masakichi, hallucinating, see himself standing in the cane, in the light burning sun, drenched in sweat, mud on his cheeks, his hand like leather glove, hold a Kachikin cut cane knife. His whole body swings to cut cane, blow after blow. See himself bending, tying, lifting. His shoulders are shaking. Walking a bundle of cane with legs, step after step. Across the burned earth, up the thin plank, dropping the load over and over, over and over. Tsuru and the children are now by his hospital bed. We cannot be beaten with every cut of the Kachiken knife. We grasp, take hold of our dreams. Be happy. I did not. We Did not fail. Masakichi died at the age of 44 years old, 24 years after he landed in Hawaii. The plantation owners were surprised at the scale and power of the Great Strike. The Japanese workers acted together, endured together for the common cause. The owners eventually agreed to pay the Japanese workers the same wages they gave to other ethnic groups. They promised to improve the housing too. The strike leader, Fred Kinzaburo Makino, was also arrested and released during the strike. He started a bilingual newspaper called Hawaii Hochi. In the first issue, he wrote, Our Hawaii Hochi does not receive any support from the plantation owners like all the other Japanese immigrant newspapers. Hence, Hawaii Hochi is free and independent. We shall never yield to limitations or restrictions. The Hawaii Hochi will appeal strongly to its reader for freedom of speech and fairness. In 1920, 11 years after Masakichi's death, Plantation workers again went on a strike, demanding higher wages and better conditions. It was bigger than anything else you ever seen in Hawaii before, with over 10,000 workers involved Japanese workers, but also many Filipinos. 
マキノズ・ハワイ・ホーチ、ビケム・ザ・ワーカーズ・ラディコ・ボイス。The demonstrator included the two children of Masakichi, his son and his daughter, continued their father's passion to speak out against the prejudice. They continued the fight he began. Now, in the early 1900s, Japanese children born in Hawaii began going to a local Japanese language school. But in 1922, territorial government passed the laws to wipe out the lower grades, to charge $1 for each student, and to control the school textbooks. Makino said no and lead a, lead a legal challenge. It went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And America's highest court ruled that Hawaii's law to control Japanese language school were unconstitutional. This was a huge victory. Japanese workers? No. All the people have the right to control their own lives. But the descendant of Japanese immigrant faced more hardship with the war between Japan and the United States. Japanese Americans on the west coast of America were imprisoned in camps. In Hawaii, all Japanese American leaders were jailed. Young Japanese American men volunteered to fight in Europe, proving their loyalty to America. Their military unit was sent into the most deadly combat zone in Europe. Many died. In 2011, In the aftermath of the Tohoku earthquake on March 11th, my script, movie script was put on hold. Still in Hawaii, I jumped at the chance to join my Japanese American friends on a tour of Japan. I saw the sparkle in their eyes. They were like kids. Other times, they were filled with distance nostalgia, deep emotion. A kind of warm hearted sacredness. When we visited some of the Shinto shrines, like Ise Jingu shrines or Izumo Taisha shrines, I was struck by how sincerely they pressed their hands together in prayers. It moved me deeply. I felt the Nippon spirit of Japan manifesting in their bodies. Back in Hawaii, in the Makiki Cemetery again, I look out to see a huge rainbow across the sky. Oh, Nijida! By watching that shining arch, I began to see it as a solid path built by those who, became, who came before me. Now in Hawaii, some 185,000 people are descendants of those early Japanese immigrants. Yes, Americans, but Japanese Americans, proud to have inherited the spirit of Japan, brought here with those early ancestors. Those early Japanese crossed the sea, joined the forces, and fought with everything they had to create a new home. Free from discrimination. This arc of history, this colorful bridge reminds me they shape the culture and the history of these islands today. It shines like rainbow, rainbow bridge with all of the colors, all the colors. For all of us.